Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Horror Analysis with me, Drew. Uh, today, we're jumping into the course. First day of actual coursework. Um, we're starting in letter A, obviously, with monsterness. And we're jumping into our buddy, Noel Carroll, who will be our buddy by the end of this, I promise. Um, he's already my buddy. And you're going to love them too. Um, the Philosophy of Horror, or Paradox of the Heart, by Noel Carroll. Boom. Um, he's going to talk about monstrousness for a while, because monstrousness is what a story needs to be a horror story. So what does a story need to be a horror story? According to Carroll, it's monstrousness. And what, pray tell, is monstrousness? I know you're all asking yourself. Well, let's see here. You know, what makes a monster? What does interstitiality and monstrosity have to do with each other? Uh, Non-monsters and near monsters, that's what I'm hoping to go through today. Um, interstitiality is a big word that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but for the most part, let's start with Noel Carroll. Um, we're, of course, in his first section, because, of course, he has to talk about what monster monstrosity is, uh, what monsterness is, before he gets into uh, anything else, obviously. So we have to, we're at the same point. Um, so he defines monster. Um, to be a horror novel, a horror tale, a horror anything, you have to have a monster. And the monster has to be threatening and impure. Um, without a monster, you merely have a tale of terror, or if it's scary, or if it's not threatening, then it's fantasy, you know, something along those lines. Um, but let's define monster. Definition of monster, according to Carroll, page 27, any being not believed to exist now according to contemporary science. Easy enough. Uh, of course, that is a big, big definition. Of course, he's going to narrow it down, and he needs to, because at the moment, we have lots of things that are anything that's not considered to be exist now according to contemporary science includes you know oompa loompas and fairies and um, dragons and you know lots of things <laughs> you know orcs and wizards and Superman and comic book villains. Um, yeah, so there's Superman isn't known to exist by comic uh, by comic book science, by regular science, by contemporary science. That's what I was after. Um, but he's not a monster. Um, so let's go over, of course, to be a monster in the horror sense, there must also be threat and impurity. Let's add threat on, because that was the easiest one. Um, if you add threat and monster together, you get rid of gnomes and fairies. Um, well, fairies somewhat, I guess, some books have them as threatening, but Tinkerbell type fairies aren't threatening. Um, let's see. Um, you get rid of lots of things. But you still have comic book villains which are, you know, Magneto and um, Bizarro, Doctor Doom, 
You still have Sauron. You still have dragons. Um, dragons, of course, can be neutral as well as bad. Um, but they're certainly threatening. Um, ogres and wizards and whatnot. You still have Voldemort. Voldemort's all so close to being monstrosity because people do sh shrink away from him. Um, I don't. This, of course, came out in 1990. Yeah, 1990. So a bit before Harry Potter came out. So, but ogres and trolls and stuff like that were certainly around in other things as well. Uh, basically, any bad guy that you'd stand up to if you had the chance against them, the only reason you'd run from them is you'd lose. Um, you'd stand up to Ma Magneto if you weren't going to get your butt handed to you. You'd stand up to Doctor Doom, you know, if he weren't powerful enough to snap you like a twig, um, no matter how big and strong you are. Um, so you have to add impurity into there. Impurity is, of course, going to be the big one because people understand threat pretty quick. Uh, impurity is going to take some time talking about. You have you can have threat, you can have impurity without threat, but you get weird stuff like Jeff Goldblum in uh, The Fly, where he's turning into a fly and he's becoming more and more disgusting, but you're not threatened by him until the end uh, when he goes nuts and starts really being a threat. Um, but there's gross stuff that is out there that's not a threat, but is impure. Um, the the eyeball monster from Big Trouble in Little China, I'm looking at my notes now, he was uh, full of just a bunch of eyeballs in a ball. Um, and he was gross. He wasn't a threat. He was certainly a, uh, a being not believed to exist now according to contemporary science, but he wasn't a threat. Um, let's take go down on my notes a little bit. As I said, being a threat is fairly obvious. It means you can, it means that they can do damage or kill the heroes, and by extension, the audience. Um, there's lots of examples in this chapter about threats and interstitiality, uh, into impurity. Um, Carol gets his thoughts on I impurity from Mary Douglas, who in the 70s wrote, what was it? I have it here. Purity and Danger. Um, impurity is through this concept called interstitiality. Being in between categories or groups. That's what dictionary definition of interstitiality is. Um, our thoughts on things being impure come from category mistakes, according to um, Miss Douglas. Uh, since then, of course, she's uh, since she wrote this originally, she backed off on some of the. Um, she was talking a lot about biblical impurity, uh, the Book of Leviticus, which is a lot of where we in the Western world get our th thoughts on impurity. There is interstitial impurity, but she said in 2005, I think it's in my notes, 2002, um, she said that pigs were not impure because of category mistakes. They're impure because it had to do with shepherding practices and not needing to shepherd pigs or not being able to shepherd pigs, something along those lines. It didn't have to do with category mistakes, which 
is often seen that way. Um, category mistakes is where most of our ideas for impurity come from. For instance, Lobster is considered impure in Leviticus because it's a crawling thing in the water where swimming things are supposed to be. It's a category mistake. If it's a water animal, it should be a swimmy animal, not a crawly animal. It sounds simplistic. I'm not trying to be a, you know, offensive to anybody, but um, I'm trying to break it down for you. Um, shrimp as well would be crawly animals in the water um, birds are okay but insects aren't because they have too many legs they're a flying thing which should have two legs but they don't they have six legs um, so therefore category mistake feces is probably what we have most of um, contact with or familiarity with it is impure because it is a or we see it as impure because it's a category mistake it is both within us and without of us and out of us um, it is of us and not of us it's the there's a a uh, slash there a dash um, a backslash there or a slash there and it says in us and out of us. Um, the uh, bodily fluids as well. They're supposed to be inside of us. When they come outside of us, we don't want to have contact with them. They're impure. Um, yeah. So, Monsters will have the same interstitiality. They will be wrong in some sort of category. They're wrong in that they shouldn't exist. Um, they're impure because they shouldn't exist. Um, they, they're category mistakes. They're wrong. Um, For instance, uh, the examples I had. Um, Peter Straub and Stephen King wrote The Talisman. That's one that um, Carol mentions. And in that, the main character, the kid, meets the monster. And the, mo he, the kid knows instinctively that the monster is radioactive and if he touches it, he'll die. Uh, there is a very common trope in horror movies that the people shrink away from the monster like that or that a lot of this motion it's the covering stay away from me don't touch me sort of thing all while screaming because you can't deal with it uh, Jonathan Harker when he meets Dracula he wants to vomit he knows there's something wrong there. Instinctively, he goes on about his business because that's his his business, and of course, we he goes on about his business because we need the plot to go on. Um, and he's British, <laughs> and he's so British um, that he's going to s stiff up her lip and go through it, even though the his the guy won't make him want to vomit. Oh, hot water, I love it. All right. Um, yes. So, purity and danger is by Mary Douglas in the seventies. I don't think I have the date for it. Um, she did talk about purity and the meaning of danger. Of course, that's obvious. Um, <laughs> And Carol adopts a lot of that. I haven't read, actually, Period of Danger. I'm taking it from what how Carol explains it. Um, in, how, where's a, what's a page? He's talking about Purity and Danger beginning on page 31. So we're certainly still in the first 
40 something pages is this section um, let's see is that right up until fantastic apologies and structure that's going to be the next couple sections um, yeah so 42 is where this the next section is going to be in so um, He's talking about Mary Douglas and how things are impure category mistakes. Um, for us, we get that feeling of creeps. It's the creeps feeling that we get when we're confronted with a monster vicariously through a... As monsters aren't real, let's just say. We get the creeps because we're confronted by monster through the agency of a character in a story or a character in a movie. Um, they are the ones that experience the monster and we through them, since we identify with them, we get the creeps. That is the impure feeling in the back of our brains, the lizard brains, um, that creeps is giving us the feeling of something that's screaming category mistake over and over and over again at us. A monster that is impure and a threat is a horror monster, according to Noel Carroll. Impure, it has a category mistake. It is interstitial. Um... And a monster and a horror tale needs this. If it doesn't have a monster, if the monster isn't impure, and if the monster is not a threat, it's not a horror tale. Pardon me. Now, of course, there's going to be what we consider horror that's not going to fit into this category. And as I mentioned last time in philosophy of art or philosophy in anything, if you have obvious examples that don't fit your theory, you're going to have problems. You're going to have people that say, wait a minute, you know, your hard work, your f 400 pages Sorry, 200 pages. It's a very, fairly short book. Um, 250 pages in the notes. Um, it's having some problems because you don't have these horror tales in your definition of horror. They These are examples that are counterexamples. Um, so you have problems. You have to explain these away. He does. He calls them tales of terror or... Um, scary tales that are not horror tales because horror needs a monster and the monster needs to be a threat and the monster needs to be impure non-monsters and near monsters will be around and certainly fans of horror will be fans of tales of terror but they will not be horror tales yeah, um, except they are. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot that I would call horror that Carol discounts. And we're going to go over them, of course. Um, oh, I do want to, oh, shoot, I should have gone over this earlier. So let's jump back, because I forgot something. Um, definition of horror, or sorry, definition of monster, blah. Drink some water, Drew. Much better. Um, definition of monster. Any believing, any being not believed to exist now, according to contemporary science. Let's look at the word now real quick, because that's pivotal, pivotal sometimes. Now means that you can have horror monsters that may exist later 
like alien. Contemporary science does not believe that aliens in the form that chased Sigourney Weaver around in Alien exist. That's not controversial in any way, shape, or form. Um, contemporary science may admit to the possibility of aliens. I think they do. Um, but possibility isn't enough. They aren't, aren't believed to exist. So aliens... Alien is good. We're good for a horror movie on Alien, and Aliens, of course. Um, and the sequels. <laughs> and the many sequels, and Predator, and whatnot. Um, not that Predator is more action movie, but... Aliens are not believed to exist according to contemporary science. So you can have monsters that are aliens. You can have dinosaurs that are aliens because not believed to exist now, according to contemporary science. Contemporary science does not believe that Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus rex and raptors are wandering around because they're not. Um, so Jurassic Park, those mons those things can be considered monsters. Um, Again, Jurassic Park is not a horror movie. Let's go to the classic of modern American uh, cinema, Pterodactyl, with Coolio as the star. This is a really awful movie, and you shouldn't watch it. Unless you really like horror, bad horror movies. In which case, you should watch it. It's kind of good in an awful way. Um, Stephen King likes to talk about in his book... You, you can't lose your taste for junk food. There's a lot of awful stuff and that you have to sit through if you're a horror fan. And it's true. Um, but it's so bad it's funny sort of thing. Coolio's pterodactyl. Um, where pterodactyls are still around in an isolated area and they go up against army guys and when they fly down to attack them, their wings actually cut the army guys in half because apparently they have razors on their wings or saws or something. Um, I don't know what. what None of it makes sense. Um, there's no internal logic to the movie either. But, of course, it could be a horror because pterodactyls are not believed. Pterodactyls are not believed. I say pterodactyl like the P isn't silent. Pterodactyls are not believed to exist now, according to contemporary science. Um, the Alton book, Meg, which is about a megalodon, a giant prehistoric shark um, that was in the seas and died out, has a megalodon as the monster. Contemporary science does not believe that a megalodon exists, so megalodons are a-okay to be horror monsters. That's going to lead to this. Non-monsters and near-monsters. Because megalodons don't exist anymore. But sharks do. Jaws, according to Carol, is not a horror movie or a book, eventually, um, because sharks exist. It's a little bit bigger than normal. That's not enough to make you know a little bit bigger than normal shark is not some is not enough to get out of this is contemporary science can believe that a little bit bigger than normal shark exists <laughs> and of course contemporary science believes that sharks that attack humans exist they have um, it's rare and it's very rare for one shark to attack more than one human um, but sharks exist um, Jaws isn't a monster. 
it's impure it's it's not even it's not really even impure it's a threat obviously so this mon uh jaws I guess you don't want jaws around you well it's kind of iffy in that one um do you consider jaws impure because you shriek away from it because you're in the water you can only shriek so much and then you're not swimming anymore um i don't know this but you you already don't have the monsterness you don't have to go through the threat and impurity you definitely have threat so it's a tale of terror according to carol um stephen king's cujo also not a monster saint bernard's exist rabies exists you know rabid saint bernard's have existed um and dogs who attack people <laughs> rabid dogs who attack people have existed uh Cujo is not a monster um because it's it's impure because it's diseased um it's not a category mistake it's a threat no one's denying that but it's not a monster and it's impure but not a category mistake impure and you probably have mentioned Serial killers and psychos are not on the list either. Um, Scream, not a horror movie, according to that. Um, Telltale Heart, not a horror movie. Crazy people exist. Crazy people who kill people exist. You don't have monster. You have threat. You don't have impurity. You don't have category mistake impurity. Schizophrenics exists, so Psycho, Norman Bates, is not a monster. Oh, he's so close, though. We'll come back to Norman Bates, because he's like, oh, he's so close to being a monster. To being a category mistake, anyway. Um, you know, he sort of is a category mistake, but he's not a monster. He's just... But he's... Ah. Um, so, of course, Psycho is a tale of terror. Um, or a movie of terror. No, it's still tale of terror. It's a narrative art uh, art form. Movies tell tales. Um, oh, who else do we have? We have Scream, Norman Bates, Eric from Phantom of the Opera. Also, not a monster. Um, he comes close as well. He comes close because, let's see, he has an almost unnatural knowledge of the sewers underneath Paris, and he has a unnatural knowledge of the theater where um, where the plot takes place. He has uh, like almost super strength, and he is deformed. Oops, where am I at? Oh, here we go. That's the that's the notes I was after. Let me grab that real quick. Um, let's see what else did I have? Oh, he has a quite he um, Noel Carroll has quite a few examples in here. Um, Eric Van of an Opera, Angel, who is in Nightfall, not one I'm familiar with, but I'll point it out to those of you who may know him. Norman Bates, which I'll come back to because it's a big one. Um, V.C. Andrews, the flowers in the attic stuff. It's creepy, and it's about incest, and it's creepy. Uh, but it's not monstrous. Incest happens, unfortunately. Um, oh. Um, going from the other side. Uh, 
Superman. Superman is a monster, but not a horror monster because he's not impure. He's a threat if you were angered. He's certainly dangerous if you're on the wrong side of him. Um, but he's not impure. Here's he, the, she men he mentions uh, E.T., Ariel from The Little Mermaid, and Swamp Thing. Um, they're monsters. Um, in the definition of monster being this, because E.T. isn't known to exist, not believed to exist anyway. Ariel, the Little Mermaid, is not believed to exist, and Swamp Thing isn't believed to exist, but um, they're not threats. Um, I mean... You know, it's definitely a category mistake. Ariel, the Little Mermaid, is half ma uh, woman, man, um, and half fish body or fish legs. It's uh, you know, there's a category mistake. People have legs that are not fishes. Fish have but you know torsos that are not humans that's a category mistake but it doesn't even seem pure um well you know you could have creepy mermaids i don't know anyway um i did have another one it was from misery because susie was it he mentioned it so well she had like an like Eric in Phantom of the Opera, she had a almost unnatural knowledge of what went on in her house. Sort of like uh, Norman Bates, too. Oh, I'd lost the page after I put the book down. Uh, it's okay, I remember it. Um, Norman Bates is, you know, really this close. Um, Robert Block, when he was writing it, I'm not sure if he admits to this, or it was just implied that he came up with the name Norman because as he kills people dressed as his mother, he's neither woman, Norman, nor man, nor man. So I thought that was cool when I read that in there. Um, in the Block's book itself, he says, you know, there's three people living in him. There's Normal, the one who comes around when the police comes comes out when the police come around who's normal, he talks to police and say, hey, how's it going? How's your parents, you know? How's your girlfriend? Whatever. Shoots the breeze and all that stuff. There's Norman, the killer, and there's Norma, the mom, um, who is in there being weird. Um, and at the end, it's Norma who sort of takes over yeah, um, but according to Carol, they don't—they're not monsters. You don't get if you don't get serial killers aren't monsters, psychos aren't monsters. Um, your slashers aren't monsters until they die and come back to life, or they take more bullets than a human being can take without dying. Um, a la. Michael Myers, you can't you can't stop that guy. Um, I think in two you realize that it's because he's uh, during Halloween he's under super power he has superpowers or whatever. Um, he's invincible or near invincible during Halloween because of witchcraft and stuff. It's weird. Um, but during one, he's norm he's a he's a dude in a mask up until you know. He doesn't become a monster until, you know, contemporary science says no, nobody can take that many, that much damage and still be walking normally. Um, so then he instantly transforms into a monster. It's this is weird stuff that Noel Carroll's theory has. 
that proponents of Noel Carroll's theory have to answer. Like, really? He's only a mon he's only a monster after he gets the crap beat out of him and is unaffected. Um, that's weird. <laughs> or you know, he's injured but unaffected. He gets a coat hanger to the eye and then disappears. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. So where was I? I think I was about done actually. Um. I got that. Mm-hmm. We did that one. Did that one. Just double-checking, folks. Yep. We're going to talk more about interstitiality in each... and category mistakes. Interstitiality is the right word, but it's so much easier for me to say category mistakes. So we're going to talk about each category mistake of types of monsters next time. Um, actually, for the next couple of times. Uh, Non-monsters and near-monsters. Oh, where is the unnatural line? When does a human become a monster? Um, well, I've mentioned a few of those. And I'm not obviously talking philosophically like, you know, Hitler was a monster. When does a man become a monster? No. Hitler was, you know, believed to exist by contemporary science. Um, he was a monster in that he killed six million Jews and several million other people and started wars that cost lives of millions and millions of soldiers and monster in that sense but he existed and he wasn't you know he was a threat but he wasn't a monster he was just a jerk a massive massive jerk um But what we're talking about is how, when does a human become a monster? Um, what type, how far, how unnatural is the degree that you have to have knowledge of the theater for Eric to be a monster? And knowledge of the sewers underneath Paris for Eric to be a monster? Um... The Phantom. That's the Phantom of the Opera again. Um, you know, he can be as deformed as possible. There's plenty of deformed people. That's not the... His deformity isn't what makes him a monster. It's... If he's a monster, it's because... He just knows... There's no way that if he's here... In his base in subterranean sewers in Paris... That he knows what's going on... 12 stories up, you know, or three stories up in the back of the, you know, a conversation that's going on in the back of the things. You know, there's, there's stuff like, a lot of the, the stories of during that time, Jules Verne did one too, where science had progressed and only he knew the science, so it was sort of like closed ca caption, uh, closed circuit television um, but not because of course that was many 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 years in the future um, and I think there was one in Jules Verne's castle in Transylvania where the evil guy was able to holographically project a singer which was weird through mirrors and I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, it's science that isn't science. So it wasn't a monster. It's science that wasn't science. It's fake science and bad science. But, you know, the fake CCTVs and... Does that make him a monster that he knows more than is possible to know? Yeah, it's close. It's so close, but I don't know. I don't have a better theory than... Noel Carroll's. I don't have one to replace it. I'm just saying that if you follow Noel Carroll's theory, you're going to have to answer some of these questions. Next time, we're going to talk about the types of monsters. Um, and this is called the biologies of horror and biologies of horror monsters. 
There's the two F's and the three M's. Fusion, fission, magnification, massification, and metonymy. Um, which we'll go over. We're going to go over magnification and massification first because they're the easiest ones to explain. Um, and then I'll have one video for fusion and I think I might be able to squish fu fission and metonymy into one video as well. Or I might do one separate video for fu fission. Sorry. One video for fusion. That's a big chunk. That's a huge chunk. That's going to be a long video in and of itself just focusing on that topic. Um, and then I might be able to cram fission and metonymy into one video or I might just do one video for each. I haven't decided yet. Um, go over my notes a lot more. So next time I'm going to go over magnification and massification which are the easiest two biologies of horror to explain. Alright, see you next time on Horror Analysis. You guys have a great night. You know, what makes a monster? What does interstitiality and monstrosity have to do with each other? Uh, Non-monsters and near-monsters, that's what I'm hoping to go through today. Um, interstitiality is a big word that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but for the most part, let's start with Noel Carroll. Um, we're, of course, in his first section, because, of course, he has to talk about what monster monstrosity is, uh, what monsterness is, before he gets into uh, anything else, obviously. So we have to, we're at the same point. Um, so he defines monster. Um, to be a horror novel, or a horror tale, a horror anything, you have to have a monster. And the monster has to be threatening and impure. Um, without a monster, you merely have a tale of terror, or if it's scary, or if it's not threatening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Horror Analysis with me, Drew. Uh, today, we're jumping into the course. First day of actual coursework. Um, we're starting in letter A, obviously, with monsterness. And we're jumping into our buddy, Noel Carroll, who will be our buddy by the end of this, I promise. Um, he's already my buddy and you're going to love them too. Um, the Philosophy of Horror, or Paradox of the Heart, by Noel Carroll. Boom. Um, he's going to talk about monstrousness for a while, because monstrousness is what a story needs to be a horror story. So what does a story need to be a horror story? According to Carroll, it's monstrousness. And what, pray tell, is monsterness? I know you're all asking yourself. Well, let's see here. There's... Superman isn't known to exist by comic, uh, by comic book science. By regular science. By contemporary science. That's what I was after. Um, but he's not a monster. Um... So let's go over, of course, to be a monster in the horror sense, there must also be threat and impurity. Let's add threat on, because that was the easiest one. Um, if you add threat and monster together, you get rid of gnomes and fairies. Um, well, fairies somewhat, I guess. Some books have them as threatening, but... Tinkerbell type fairies aren't threatening. Um, let's see. Um, you get rid of lots of things. But you still have comic book villains. Sure, then it's fantasy, you know, something along those lines. 
Um, but let's define monster. Definition of monster, according to Carroll, page 27, any being not believed to exist now according to contemporary science. Easy enough. Uh, of course, that is a big, big definition. Of course, he's going to narrow it down, and he needs to, because at the moment, we have lots of things that are anything that's not considered to be exist now according to contemporary science includes you know oompa loompas and fairies and um, dragons and you know lots of things <laughs> you know orcs and wizards and Superman and comic book villains um, yeah so you know Magneto and um, Bizarro Doctor Doom you still have Sauron you still have dragons um, dragons of course can be neutral as well as bad um, but they're certainly threatening. Um, ogres and wizards and whatnot. You still have Voldemort. Voldemort's all so close to being monstrosity because people do sh shrink away from him. Um, I don't. This, of course, came out in 1990. Yeah, 1990. So a bit before Harry Potter came out. So, but. Ogres and trolls and stuff like that are certainly around in other things as well. Uh, basically, any bad guy that you'd stand up to if you had the chance against them, the only reason you'd run from them is you'd lose. Um, 